Welcome to part two. What did we decide to call this part? It's like how I learned to stop worrying and get stuff done. I don't know. As usual, we don't have a name, but this one's about problem solving. <laughs> Well, the easiest way to solve problems is to get somebody else to solve your problem, isn't it? It is, but uh, now, at, at this point in your career, you are the people someone hires to do the problem solving for them, so. Yeah, so that means you give someone money to solve your problems, or you ask on the internet until everyone is annoyed with you, and then they basically give you the question answer to go away. So every day when you wake up, you're gonna open up your email, and it's gonna be filled with other people's problems. And you have to deal with it. <laughs> so maybe you don't stop worrying necessarily, <laughs> but uh, you learn to deal with it. And, and hopefully this video will cover some of that. So before you harass other people for your solutions, you need to level up your skills to be able to actually solve the problems yourself. And we can probably give you some pointers on that and help you figure that out. At this, the, the problem solving thing is literally the most important part of anything we can tell you to get good at. Because everything everything about this world is problem solving if you can break it down to smaller problems that's great but you must follow the same rules every time to keep yourself from wasting a lot of time trying to solve all these problems basically use the scientific method you know double check that everything's working correctly and then like you know what could be isolate each individual element that could be causing the problem like is it the browser is it the size is it user error someone just messing something up because they're bad <laughs> this is so important that there's no way you're going to learn everything you need to know from a video you're actually going to have to do a lot of reading and you should start with the scientific method if you don't have a really good understanding of what the scientific method is uh you're not going to be able to apply it so you should definitely read the wikipedia article on the scientific method um, eric raymond has also written a lot on how to ask a good question those things are from the infancy of the internet but they're still a very timeless resource but it's a lot of reading you also shouldn't be totally using the internet as a crutch. Believe it or not, these kinds of technology and programming, these, these things, happened before the internet existed, amazingly. <laughs> and there's other things you can look at. Books, for example, the artifacts from a different time, still have a lot of useful information. And there's good books on whatever topic that you want to solve problems with. The advantage of that is that you might learn more than just how to solve the problem at hand, which will make you better at what you're doing. From the design standpoint, a lot of people think, oh, you just make things look pretty. And that's true. Part of my job is to make things look pretty. But also, you know, part of it is, is problem solving, you know, figuring out how do I make it easy for this person to get to a store? How do I make this form work? That kind of thing. And one of the biggest resources you can get for compositions and things like that is looking at books, looking at what other people have done to solve this problem so you don't have to solve it for like the hundredth time. There are some really good books. Um, uh, the Design of Design by Fred Brooks, um, Don't Make Me Think or, or Don't Think or something like that by Krug. These are, it's like, it's not just making it pretty, it's also making it functional. You're designing a user experience with a program and let's face it, I mean, you're probably watching this because you're going to use a computer in some form in your career. You're going to be creating something. You're going to be inventing something. And so you're going to have to be aware of how people are going to use your creations. Now, there are drawbacks to books, especially when it comes to programming. And that is they get out of date really quick. Yes. I mean, the, the newest version is going to change a lot of things. You're going to learn in that book and you're going to need to apply it in the real world anyway. I don't know anybody who's learned to program just purely reading a book and it's like, Same with drawing. You can't it's do like that. I'm ready now. So there are good and bad. Uh, Krista mentioned looking at other people's work in the programming world. There's a great way to do that. And that is by reading source code. Yes. It turns out that getting good at reading source code is hugely important. I mean, without overgeneralizing a programmer sort of goes through three phases. It's like, this code is crap. I could rewrite this. And then, uh, this code is crap, but I'm not going to rewrite it because I'm scared to death of it and I'm not even going to bother trying to figure out what it does. And then finally, your, the ultimate transformation is, oh, I see what terrible thing this person had to do and that is why with this code is crap in the first place. <laughs> Don't judge. Just read. <laughs> Just read. 
Sometimes you'll find comments in the source code that explain why it's terrible as well. And they'll, <laughs> they'll tell you exactly who made them do what they had to do. One of my favorite comments was uh, this comment that was like, the, the below counter indicates the number of hours programmers have spent trying to optimize the following routines. When you look at this, decide it's horrible, and then dump a bunch of time into trying to optimize it. Be sure to increment this counter when you fail. And it was some obscenely large number. <laughs> I've seen that thread. It's a good one. <laughs> so, again, not a perfect way to solve your problems but it can lead you in the right direction if you solely rely on that it could be bad code and you could be leading yourself down a, a, a false trail if you have a computer science stint there are co certain kinds of things that you can learn from books that are, are basically timeless and these are called design patterns uh, algorithms some books on algorithms things like that a lot of books on algorithms will teach you the algorithm in sort of pseudo code um, a lot of the nuff programming books uh, are not bad, but uh, design pattern has sort of become like the hipster version of that. It's, it's sort of the hipster vernacular. And so a design pattern for solving like a traveling salesperson problem or different kinds of problems that, that you would encounter. If you only have a very low level understanding of like the computer science part of it, um, a, a very good introductory book on those types of algorithms and, and to give you an idea of what a design pattern is, is called, um, uh, every uh, algorithms to live by and it's a very easy understandable book but it covers a lot of you know, it's sort of like in, in not a computer scientist language it covers a lot of what makes up your computer science education at a typical four-year university now these are all great answers if you are wanting to increase your the breadth and depth of your knowledge but algorithms to live by isn't going to show you how to solve this one problem that you're having with your form that someone is saying they need tomorrow, right? <laughs> yes. So finally, when you're super desperate, you might have to Google it. <laughs> Googling it, so Googling it opens up another Pandora's box of crazy because then you're dealing with other people on the internet and that becomes a variable. A, a, a terrifying variable. A lot of times, like one of the great resources you'll find is a Stack Overflow. And you'll go there and you'll put in your question and you'll phrase it really well and make sure that it makes sense and then someone will say, well, why are you using that library? Why are you doing it this way? You should just <laughs> use this other thing that I've designed and I've done and just do that. And it's like, but my requirements are such that I, I, I can't do that. But there's always one person in every thread who does that. Now, asking questions and getting answers and answering other people's questions, that's a huge topic. We're not going to cover it here. We're actually going to cover it in another video. The next one in the series. But just keep in mind, when you Google things, again, you have to be prepared to sift through a lot of crap to find what you're looking for and you have to be ready to be very specific and very understanding of others yeah and having good discernment <laughs> about whether or not it's crap and that's something that comes with time like you know you'll try a lot of stuff that you'll see just like little snippets of code that you find places and it'll be like this will probably work right and then you'll get some sort of horrific like long error code and it's like okay that didn't work i will remember not to take suggestions from this person or for this particular <laughs> thing again but and you need to learn how to use google effectively uh, you know there's lots of little tips and tricks for google for uh, you can't quote the entire error message you know it's not going to be on the same line number for the the next yeah. person so you have to learn to how to do that effectively but often a lot of people will have had your same exact problem and you can find an absolute solution doing that chances are if what you're doing is not something someone else has encountered before you really have to question why you're doing whatever it is that you're doing yeah. are you out of your depth that's the well there are no new ideas under the sun there are no new php errors under the sun it's always it's always the same ones well, i don't understand what am i doing wrong ah. now when you are dealing with answers from other people on the internet you have to keep in mind that sometimes people answer questions on the internet just to hear themselves talk and a lot of other people that may know what they're doing will just not respond or engage with that person and so it looks like somebody has answered a question but that's not actually what happened there it's what somebody said something so dumb that nobody felt that it was worth their time to respond ultimately none of these are going to guarantee an answer for you they're all great resources, but you might find out that you didn't find it on Google. You don't have the books. No one's willing to answer the question for you. You have to do it yourself and your deadline is tomorrow. <laughs> and at that point, you have to embrace the scientific method 
and just painstakingly work your way through these problems. <laughs> also known as bashing the keyboard with your palm until something falls out. Although you're productively bashing the keyboard with your palm because you're changing one thing at a time. You're not failing, you're learning. Yeah. <laughs> Doing one thing at a time cannot be overemphasized because I know a lot of people, like, when they first start, they'll troubleshoot something and all they'll do is they'll, they'll be like, well, I changed like five different things and it fixed it, but I don't know what of the five things I changed actually fixed it. <laughs> and it's like, if you just do one at a time. Or I changed five things and it's now broken in a different way and I'm not sure how to get back. <laughs> yeah, I had, a, oh, I had a professor, he was he was great. He was a computer science professor, but he, would, he had a real bad habit of going into Firebug and he would go into Firebug and he would change like 20 things in the CSS code and then be like, I don't know how to reproduce this in the actual file now, but I did fix all the problems. And it's like, <laughs> if you had just done it in the actual CSS and not Firebug. Did someone show this man live reload? Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was one of those things. So always go step by step, one by one, when you're troubleshooting something. But if you can get good at that and make it a habit, then you might become one of the people who can solve things when others can't. You can be... And someone, get paid for that. Yeah, who can answer the questions <laughs> and get a reputation for that. And that can be very valuable. So with all of that, you've got to internalize it. You've got to actually apply it. it it's going to be up to you. You're going to see all kinds of crazy stuff on the internet. And you may have to ask questions. I mean, that's what it really comes to. But if you've done the work and you've put in and people on the internet can see that you've put in the work, then they may give you, they may feel like answering your questions because you've put in the work, you've done the scientific method, you've, you, you know, you're not just a lazy person asking for somebody to do it for you. They may also ridicule you and reject you and shame you because you asked a very poor question and you didn't give enough details and you didn't follow the, uh, the, the proper workflow. Asking a question is its own little microcosm, especially on the internet, especially about programming and things like that. And that's why we need a whole other video <laughs> to talk to you about asking and answering questions on the internet, which is coming up next in this series. This, this channel has become nothing but talking heads. It's crazy. There is, of course, good writing on that, but you're going to have to stay tuned. We will see you in the next video. You know, the one thing that we didn't cover about solving your problem, there is another way to get your problem solved for you. Yeah, if you've asked questions online, if you've followed the scientific method, you've done everything you can, but you just cannot do it, there is the, uh, the last resort. <laughs> the last resort can be very effective, depending on how much you're willing to spend. <laughs>